And so, um, just for a reminder, I'm, I'm going to use uh, the screen up here a little bit this morning with some of what we're looking at. But the first commandment is found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. And the first commandment is, You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods. God says, He is it. There are no other gods, and you shall not even make up any other gods and have them before me. So we're going to dive into that and what that might mean this morning uh, for us as believers. Just uh, so you know, there is a positive side and a negative side to each commandment. And the positive side expresses the duties which are commanded uh, with, with it. And then the negative side expresses the sins which are forbidden. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to start out with looking at the duties that come with this commandment. So um, how many of you growing up uh, heard of Bible drills? All right. Sometimes they were called sword drills with your Bibles. So um, this morning we're going to be looking up a lot of scripture. So I hope that you can try to keep up with me. There's going to be uh, different points up here with a scripture reference. And at the very least, I want you to at least write the reference down. So maybe later you can look it up. But if you're able to follow and keep up this morning, I hope you will. Uh, because as we begin to look at these different duties, um, we're going to start out with this first one, which is, the duty to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God. And we're going to skip around different places in the Bible. We're going to start in Isaiah 54, excuse me, 45. I said it backwards. Isaiah 45. And my sermon this morning is going to be a little different than usual because there, there's not a lot that I can add to what we're going to read in the scripture and so we're just going to let the word do the preaching to us this morning i'll add a few comments here and there maybe for clarity but the duty to know and acknowledge god to be the only true god isaiah chapter 45 and guess what i'm going to read the whole thing this is the word of the lord and so uh i think if the israelites could could uh listen to the word of God read all day and stand up for it, that we can at least sit and hear one chapter. So uh, here's what Isaiah 45 talks about as dealing with God being the only God there is. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no other God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, 
what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the works of my hands you command me. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens and all their hosts I have commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free. Not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord, the labors of Egypt and merchandise of Cush and of the Sabaeans, men of stature shall come over to you and they shall be yours. They shall walk behind you. They shall come over in chains and they shall bow down to you. They will make supplication to you saying, surely God is in you and there is no other. There is no other God. Truly you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go in confusion together who are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together. You have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your cause. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth and righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. I think God made it pretty clear that he's the only God there is here in this passage and uh, that he's the creator and he did not create in vain and he wants us to know that he is the only true God. Well also along with the duty to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God there is also the duty to worship God. The duty to worship God and you could probably think of many places in the Bible where we're told to worship God. I just want to point out to you Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7. Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7. Here's what these verses say. And these, these verses uh, form a song that some of you might be familiar with. Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So we're to worship God and him only. And then we also have a duty to glorify God, to glorify God. If you'll just turn back to Psalm 29, verse two, this verse tells us that. Psalm 29, verse two. It says to give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So we're to worship God, we're to glorify God, we're to recognize him as the one and only true God. And in the midst of all of that, we have a duty to think about God. 
to think about God. You know, I've often wondered, how much, how often do you think about God? How, how much throughout the day do you think about the Lord? How much of a part of your decision making is God? When you, when you go throughout your day and you, and you, let's say you read the newspaper or you uh, see some uh, news on the television or you uh, see something on the internet and how, how quickly does your uh, belief and your faith and your understanding of God start to kind of filter, help you filter through all of that? Well, we have a duty to think about God and that comes from, if you will, the, the great commandment which is in Matthew 22 and verse 37, where it says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your what? Your mind, your mind. So uh, you remember those ads, the mind is a terrible thing to waste? Well, some people waste their mind a lot on things that aren't important. And let's, let's not waste our brain power on things that don't matter. Let's, let's use our minds to think about the Lord often. We're not only thinking about the Lord, but we also have the duty to meditate on God, the duty to meditate. And what is that? That's in, that includes thinking about God, but it's just sort of musing. It's, it's contemplating. It's, it's, it's not only thinking about God and who he is and what he's like, but it's also uh, more personal. It's like uh, just knowing him and, and, and considering him and, and Lord, what would you have me do? So let's look at uh, Psalm 145, verse five. Some of you are there already and I'm not. So give me a minute. See, I have a big, thick Bible because it's a super giant print. So I have more pages to turn. But anyway, all right. Psalm 145, verse 5. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. I mean, think about, like, if you're facing a, a dilemma in your life, if you're facing an adversity in your life, and you're, you're asking God for wisdom and guidance, or you're just thinking about what, what, what would the Lord want me to do? Um, think about how faithful God has been in the past. Think about how God always keeps his word. Think about how there's never a time when you cannot trust God. You can always trust him. I mean, just things that, that the more you get into his word, the more, um, the more there is for you to think about, about God, to help you consider when you're trying to make decisions. And then there's the duty to remember God, the duty to remember God. Ecclesiastes, which is right after Psalms and Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse one. Uh, I think some of you know this verse pretty well. Um, Ecclesiastes 12, 1, the duty to remember God. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. How many of you are young? <laughs> well, don't forget him because it says before the difficult days come. How many of you would say you're in difficult days? All right. And, and the years draw near when you say I have no pleasure in them. We're to remember God. And again, a lot of these are very similar and they almost um, mesh together. Um, but there are some distinctives, if you will. And then the duty to honor God. Up in the New Testament, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. I love this verse, 1 Timothy 1, 17. Listen to this, if you're... If you're not there yet, just, you can just write it down. But it says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, 
to God who alone is wise be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, there's a lot of crossover in, in the scriptures. Um, God, it's, God is so good. He is so wonderful and amazing. All right, so next we'll, we'll go to the duty to esteem God highly. The duty to esteem God highly. Psalm 71, verse 19. Let me see if I can get there. Psalm 71, verse 19. The duty to esteem God highly, it says, Psalm 71, 19. Also, your righteousness, O God, is very high. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? Who is like our God? Nobody. Nobody. Nobody comes close. The closest person is Jesus because he is the image of the invisible God. Yeah. All right. Well, then not only are we to esteem God highly, but we have a duty to believe God. We have a duty to believe God. If he is God and he cannot lie, then we have a duty to believe him because he tells the truth, because he is the truth. In fact, in John chapter 5, verse 24, John 5, 24 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. So the, the duty to believe God. And then there's the duty to trust God. The duty to trust God. You, you might think, well, that's the same thing as believing. Well, it is, but it's not quite. I mean, there's, you know, little nuances, if you will. But Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I bet a lot of you know this one by heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Yeah. See, the duty to trust God. Just why? Because he's so much smarter than we are. <laughs> he's got a better plan for our life than we do. Uh, if, if you've seen laying around the church, those how to have a full and meaningful life tracks, if you want to know, it's just by loving God, following, trusting God. But related to that though also is Psalm 37 verse four. And I think you know this verse, but you don't know it by the reference. And here's what it says. Delight thyself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So if you're delighting in him, if he is what you're all about. He's gonna even direct your desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. So there's the duty to delight in God. And then there's the duty to rejoice in God. And I know you know this verse too. So these, these aren't unfamiliar to you, a lot of them. Paul says in Philippians 4.4, Rejoice in the Lord, how often? Always. And again, he says, rejoice. rejoice. So this is something we're to be about. Rejoicing in God. Rejoice in the Lord. All right. So the next one is the duty to obey God and submit to him. This is Jeremiah 7.23 that probably I would think you've read, but maybe not. Let me see if I can even find it here. Jeremiah 7. And 23. All right, let's see. Here we go. Jeremiah 7, 23. This is what I commanded them saying, 
Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's from Exodus 19, where we'd studied before we got right into the Ten Commandments. And walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. So there's the duty to obey God and submit to him, that it may go well with you. Why are things not going well with you? Well, you might want to check and see how closely are you walking and obeying God and submitting to him. And then there's that verse from Micah, chapter six, verse eight, which again, I'm sure is very familiar to you. Micah six, verse eight says, he has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. That's what the word of God says, to walk humbly before our God. And so we have uh, duties that are uh, inherent in the commandment of you shall have no other gods before me. But then we also have sins that we're to avoid when it comes to these command, this commandment. And one is the sin of atheism. The sin of atheism. And that well-known verse, Psalm 14, verse one, where it says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is what? There is no God. God says, you're a fool if you don't think there's a God. In fact, in the New Testament, in Romans 1, Paul's going to say that the evidence is clear through what has been made that you are without excuse. So you can't say there's no God without suppressing the truth in your own heart. Well, then there is the sin of idolatry, right? If we have another God before the true God, we are breaking really the second commandment, which we'll get to next week, but the sin of idolatry. Uh, look at Jeremiah 2, uh, verses 27 and 28, and then we'll look at Isaiah 44. Let me see if I can get back to Jeremiah here. Yeah, this print is so big in my Bible, Jesus wept is on six pages. No, it's not, it's not that, it's not that bad. But you know, it's something about getting older, your eyes change. Y'all had that happen to you yet? Okay, I'm just saying. Um, Jeremiah 2, 27 and 28. Saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone you gave birth to me. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will arise and save us. Say, arise and save us. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise. If they can save you in the time of your trouble, for according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Judah. So God's getting on to them about you're trusting in so many things that aren't gonna do any good for you. And then uh, back in Isaiah, you know, we just read all of chapter 45, but chapter 44 is very similar. It has a lot of the same thoughts that there is no other God. And when you're talking with your Mormon friends, your LDS folks, Isaiah 44 and 45 are a really great place to go um, with that. But Isaiah 44, verses 9 through 21, it's pretty long, so I'm just going to read it. But it's the Word of God. Isaiah 44, verse 9. Those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? Surely all his companions would be ashamed, and the workmen they the, and the workmen they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear. 
they shall be ashamed together. All right, listen to this next part. The blacksmith with tongs works one in the coals, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with the compass. He makes it like the, the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself. He takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat. He, he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me for you are my God. They do not know or understand, for he has shut their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge, nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, he, and he cannot deliver his soul. Nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. So what's Isaiah saying? He's saying, how can somebody take a block of wood and make a carving out of it and with the same piece of wood worship this and say this is a god that i made i mean in that really who's more of the god in that situation it's the one who made it makes no sense and then you're going to use the other piece to stay warm with and then you're going to use the other piece of the same block to cook over and and god is using isaiah just to say how uh, utterly dumb that is it makes no sense so the sin of idolatry is one thing we should avoid and then the sin of omission or the neglect of anything due to God Matthew 21 uh, verses 28 to 32 is a parable of Jesus Matthew 21 28 to 32 listen to this Jesus says but what do you think a man had two sons and he came to the first one and said go and work today in my vineyard he answered and said I, I will not but afterward he regretted it and he went then he came to the second and said likewise and he answered and said I go, sir. In other words, okay, I'll do it. But he didn't. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said of him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So what's, what was Jesus saying in that parable? He was saying, when God tells you to do something, do it. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Don't say, okay, God, I'm going to do it, and then don't do it. Um, the pro Proverbs would say it's better to not vow than to vow and not pay. 
Well, let's move on. Next would be the sin of forgetting God. The sin of forgetting God. What happens when people forget God? Nothing good, for sure. But let's see what Hosea says about it. Hosea 13, verses 4 through 6. The sin of forgetting God. Here's what it says. Yet I am the Lord your God, ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me. Just like we're talking about. For there is no Savior besides me. I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. When they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they forgot me. You know, sometimes when we have much as people, when we have a lot, when we have plenty, sometimes that can be a curse because we get so self-absorbed thinking that, look what I have. I don't need God. I've got all this and I, I'm happy and I'm free and I'm rich and I have all this stuff and we forget God. And that's what Israel did as God blessed them. They got more and more big headed about it and they forgot God. Well, then there's the sin of having false notions about God. The sin of having false notions about God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 18 It says here, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness will you compare him? Again, there's nothing. You can have a false notion about God. And then there's the sin of having unworthy or wicked thoughts about God. Having unworthy or wicked thoughts about God. Psalm chapter 50, verse 21 Psalm 50, verse 21. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. When we bring God down to our level and think he's just like us, we're having unworthy and wicked thoughts about God. And then there's the sin of curious searching into his secrets. Curious searching into his secrets. Folks, God is mysterious, and I don't claim to understand a lot about God. There, there, <laughs> God doesn't have to tell me or explain anything to me. He has explained a lot, but the Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever and ever that we may do all the words of this law. So there's some things that God is doing that I don't understand and he's not obligated to tell me. And so just because I don't understand something doesn't make it wrong. It just means that God's being God and I'm not God. And then there's the sin of the hatred of God. Do y'all know some people hate God? They do. They wish there was not a God. In fact, that's why a lot of people claim to be atheist or agnostic is because they can't stand the fact that there's a God because if there's a God, then that means they're accountable to him and they don't want to be. But in Romans 1, verse 30, it talks about, uh, it's, it's a list of the sins that everyday people deal with. And, and one, of the word, one of the phrases there is backbiters and then haters of God haters of God. So we sin when we have hatred of God. I've got just a few more. There's the sin of self-love. The sin of self-love. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 5. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. We live in a day of self-love, of me, myself, and I, and of me first. There's this very famous website on the internet that's all about videos, and it's called something, what is it? YouTube. YouTube. 
What's the first part of YouTube? You. <laughs> it's all about you. Um, and then it continues through verse 5, but I'm not going to read that far. Then there's the sin of self-seeking. The sin of self-seeking. James chapter 3, verse 16. Let's see here. James 3 and verse 16, where the word tells us here, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But then he talks about the wisdom from above as pure and peaceable and gentle. All right. Then there's the sin of inordinate and immoderate setting our mind, will, or affections upon things other than God. And this is one we do a lot more than we probably care to admit. We put other things before God. We might not intentionally do it or realize we're even doing it, but eventually we, the, God's, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes to us. And so 1 John 2, 15 and 16, it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then Colossians 3, 2 talks about who Christ, who is our life, when he appears, we shall be like him. Then there's the sin of unbelief. Hebrews 3.12 talks about that. We read that last week, actually. Hebrews 3.12, which says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Then there's the sin of despair. You know, Christians should be the most happy, the most hopeful people on the planet. On the planet. But how often do we complain and whine and despair about things? As if we have no hope. As if God's not really up there on his throne ruling. But in Romans 15 verse 13, the Bible says this. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen, Amen to that. And then there's the sin of hardening our hearts. Romans 2 verse 5, where it says here, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And then there's the sin of pride. There's the sin of pride, and the Bible speaks a lot about that. But particularly here in James chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God gives grace. Uh, uh, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble the humble well there's actually <laughs> there's actually more that I could say and I'll share this with you later but I'm not going to go through all the rest but there's the sin of tempting God there's the sin of praying to or worshiping saints angels or any other creatures and I have these notes if y'all want them there's the sin of all compacts and consulting with the devil the sin of making man the Lord over our faith and conscience, and the sin of resisting and grieving the Spirit, and finally the sin of discontentment and impatience with God's dealings, charging him foolishly for what he brings or allows into our lives. And so as we think about those this morning, I want you to think about this. Uh, as we prepared to receive the Lord's Supper this morning. Think about what the Lord has done for you. Think about how often you have had other gods before him. 
and think about the sin that you are guilty of. But yet think about the grace and the love that God gives to you through his son, Jesus Christ, who died in your place on the cross, taking your punishment upon you. Let's bow for a word of prayer and then we're going to sing a, a song and then we'll have the Lord's Supper right after that. Our Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we want to thank you for your love for us. Lord, as we've seen this morning and we didn't even get through all of it, how really detailed it can be when we really think about what it means to have no other gods before you, the duties that we need to, to be about and the sins we need to avoid. And Lord, we've broken your law, but Lord, we're thankful that Christ paid our fine. And Lord, that we can come to you and be reconciled and redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. And we thank you for Jesus and the hope that we have within him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Our uh, hymn before we have the Lord's Supper this morning is uh, here at your table board. It's two verses.